This is Duff McKagan. And this is Dizzy Reed from Guns N' Roses. Hey, I'm Slash, and you're watching Loudwire. In 1979, you decided to form a band with Steven Adler, and uh, the band never materialized, but it prompted you to take up an instrument, and it also added that Adler had designated himself the role of guitarist, so you decided to pick up the bass first. Yeah, I mean, he had a guitar, so therefore he was a guitar player. <laughs> he was the most qualified. I didn't at have that anything, time. so. <laughs> but yeah, I thought I would end up. I thought I would play bass, and then I ended up not knowing much about the difference between bass and guitar. When I met a guitar teacher, uh, he asked me, "So, why do you want to play bass? Do you have an instrument?" Blah, blah blah. I said, "No," and he was playing guitar at the time. He was doing guitar solos, and I was like, "That's what I want to do." And yeah. I was like, "Oh, then you want to play guitar?" And I was like, "Okay." Very cool. And so you did actually play the bass first? I did, never had one. Never had so a bass, I, yeah. but... It was just a pipe dream. <laughs> uh, it says you were taught to play bass by your brother Bruce, and you further developed your skills by playing along with 1999 by Prince and Damaged by Black Flag. That's a fact. That's true, okay. Those two albums in particular, uh, any other ones? Those were two of the, like, the first gigs I saw, first gig I ever played was my band The Banes opening for Black Flag when Ron Rays was Ooh. in the band. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. killer. And then I saw The Clash, um, 79 Before London Calling. And those were two gigs that really influenced like how it should be done. Yeah. Those, both those bands at that time uh, played the music like aggressive and, but it's truthful. You know, it was honest. All that stuff was really honest. The, the, like the crowds that were there were just, punk rock was new, it was small. So it was like just this sort of, um, I don't know, like everybody was in it together. And that's the way that influenced how I do music to this day, really. It says that you met the original lineup of Guns N' Roses in 1985 while your band, The Wild, was rehearsing in a neighboring studio. Fact. Fact. Okay. So uh, this was the first time that you had met Guns N' Roses. Did yes. you know who they were back then? Um, just their reputation around town was, was pretty big at that time. Okay. And cool. So yeah, so. I knew who they were, and we all knew who they were. Um, but I hadn't met them and, and uh, met Stephen first. They were, they, we were actually moving out of a smaller studio into the bigger one next door. And so it was, uh, it was in the, this thing called the recycler which is like craigslist oh yeah of course but it was you know yeah. before i've heard before the, the internet basically before, yeah. and um so the, the manager of the place had put it up you know that it was up available for rent so we were sort of in this uh transitional period and we were hanging out in there and steven walked in to look at it and mm -hmm. so we met him and then the rest of the band came later and then i met axel uh, later after that and all in that same room and then we lived next door to each other for about six months I think a lot of people know this, but you auditioned for Poison, mm. uh, and that didn't come to fruition. But I, I was curious of how close did you come exactly? Um, yeah. Well, what happened was I went down there, I played the shit out of the songs, but I wasn't too keen on the dress code. Really? And okay. so that was that. So, okay, so... Well, because Poison was a full-on 80s hair glam kind of thing. Of course. People and mistook I was pretty them for sort women. Of down to earth sort of as is, it's pretty much the same as I am now. And when we had, you know, had this conversation about like I, I remember it was something about shoes and I was like, huh, come again? <laughs> and it just, you know, it just wasn't gonna happen. And I left there that day and CC was walking in for his audition and I knew that so that's gonna be the guy because he was dressed to the nines and sequins and makeup and the hair was up and the whole bit and that's you know that was what the image was about. Damn. What was what was wrong with your shoes? Did you just come in with like I, I, was, wearing, or I, know, I was wearing moccasins. Moccasins? Yeah. <laughs> that's not very poison is it? Uh, it says for Guns N' Roses uh, Appetite for Destruction it says uh, Kisses Paul Stanley was interviewed to produce the album, yeah. but rejected after insisting on changes to the songs and changes to Steven Adler's drum setup. That's correct. Really? It sounds really harsh on that Wikipedia, you, how you read it to me, but yeah, that's, that's correct. It sounded a little harsh. What was the, uh, well, what was the deal then? Was it just... Uh... We were looking for a producer, like you have, we got a record deal and... Um, the thing was to look for a producer. We Mutt Lang was our like okay. Let's have that would have been so weird. Yeah, <laughs> but he cost more just to walk in the room than we had for a record. Of course. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was out, and then 
uh, Paul Stanley came and saw us at Raji's. I got to give him that. Like, Raji's is, is a shithole, you know? <laughs> and he came down. Like, and wow. It's Paul Stanley. And we were just like a shithole place playing band at that point. Um, and he was into the band, but he had a different vision. He wanted to add more drums. And we just got done taking away all Steven's drums. Oh, uh, okay. No rack tom, nothing. And he, and he envisioned rack toms and... Um, so that was a quick meeting. I was like, okay, well, we got to... Okay. Thanks, so. you're Mr. You know, Paul Stanley. Like, we thought it was cool to have a meeting with Paul Stanley. Sure. Um, but uh, we, we had a pretty clear vision of what what our songs were. Sure. And what they weren't, and what they weren't supposed to be. Double Talk and Jive. Uh, the opening line of, of the song, found a head and an arm in a garbage can refers to body parts Izzy Stradlin actually found in a dumpster in the vicinity of the studio. Um, I, you know, honestly, I don't know, so I'm gonna have to go with fiction. I mean, it, <laughs> it, if it's fact, you have to know that that happened. He must have. He probably. You'd think that someone would mention that, especially if you're in the studio. Hey, I found yeah. a dead body outside when I was taking out the trash. Yeah, you know, he's he's kind of a mysterious character. But I'm That's just, true. I'm just going to go with fiction because I don't know. <laughs> okay. And, and I don't want it. any fucking part of it, to be honest. <laughs> you weren't a part of it. No. No, I was not. I really liked this one. It said that you rented uh, an early 1970s Marshall uh, for the recording of Appetite for Destruction and that you enjoyed the amp so much that you tried to keep it by telling the rental company that it had been stolen. Right. However, the amp was repossessed by the company after a roadie accidentally brought it to a rehearsal. At SAR. At the place where you rented it from. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Oh, my God. Were you really pissed at him? Just like you guys... I was furious, you know. I mean, it was a great sounding amp for one. And, uh, you know, and then it left me with no amp at the studio. <laughs> so I was screwed all around. It says that you originally wrote the song It's So Easy as a solo track, but then later completed it with Guns N' Roses. Uh, I guess true-ish. I, I, um, Did you kind of come up with a skeleton for it beforehand? It's, it's, it was a, f yeah, it was full demo, um, just at my west, our like, friend's apartment. Mm -hmm. He moved in next door to me, he had a four track and a drum machine. Okay. And uh, so we just, like, in learning how to work the four track and the drum machine, uh, that was one of the first songs uh, I wrote. He taught me open E wow. tuning on, on a. Yeah. So you can just bar everything. And whenever you learn a new tuning, you write like 15 songs. Like, yeah. Cool. I can write. Because it's just a different. Back to the punk rock kind of chords, just keep yeah. it simple. Powerful. Yeah. So that song, and it, obviously none of that stuff had really happened to me yet. Like, right. It wasn't. It was kind of it was meant to be tongue in cheek, and uh, mm -hmm. and I think Axel heard it. He's like, dude, and uh, but that's you know we we shared ideas, and and uh, you have to kind of lose your ego when you, if you got a riff or something, you bring it into sure. that band because um, we would tear stuff apart and put it back together. Yeah, um, it's so easy. Kind of what it was straight, almost straight from the demo. Um, but Axel sang it much better than I did. <laughs> yeah. I still, it's still kind of like a duet, a little bit. My voice is in there. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, he crushed me. But, yeah. It says on Wikipedia that Welcome to the Jungle was written in approximately three hours. Yeah. There was the, the basic riff, which I already had in the intro and all that kind of stuff. And then we started working on it as a band, we had only three hours time allotted at Nikki Beat Studios, so we had three hours to get that song done. And that, whoa, that's so crazy to think that just something that, and most of the songs on that record, you know, especially musically and, and the arrangements and stuff, were all done, we had short attention spans, so we'd work really hard on it until it was finished and move on, you know. Wow, that's so weird to think that something that ended up being that, that big and that big influential that, yeah. just yeah. happened. Three hours ago, it just didn't exist, and now it does. Crazy. Uh, it says that my world uh, was written and recorded in three hours under the influence of magic mushrooms. <laughs> That's fiction. <laughs> That's fiction. Okay. I, mean, I wish that was true. I don't know. Maybe it is true. I got to go with fiction. I, I don't remember any mushrooms being involved. Okay, fine. We'll say fiction for that one. Chinese democracy uh, was reportedly near completion in mid-2000 when... Uh, Roy Thomas Bar uh, Baker 
convinced Axel to re-record the entire record? Um, well, th that's uh, that is that is that is fiction. That's fiction. Okay. Now, although he was involved, I don't know if it was uh, him that did the convincing or whatnot. I think you know part of that is fiction. So I'll just I'll just say fiction. Fiction. So you yeah. think it was, it was more Axel's decision? Like I'm not, I'm not going to say that either. I'm just going to say that what you okay. have said there is, is fictitious. It said in 2001. Uh, you were diagnosed with cardiomyopathy, and you were originally given between six days and six weeks to live. Right. What's it like hearing that news? At the time, I just remember being concerned about how I was going to make up the dates that I canceled when I got sick in the first place. Was, oh, that, was, okay. that was my biggest concern. And uh, I managed to get through it, and I did make up the dates, so it's all good. Wow. So, that, that's so odd to me that they would be so specific as saying Six well, days. Well, you know, the reality was that was one doctor's opinion. And then the other doctor wanted to do a complete heart transplant. And then the third doctor was the one that said, no, we have a way of, of we can work this out. What's your mindset during that period? You're being, it feels like you're just being jerked around all these ways. They're thinking of ta removing your heart. Other people are saying you're going to die in less than a week. Right. But I was pretty out of it at the time. <laughs> I just, I don't think the impact, you know, um, the graveness of it really hit me uh, at the time. I guess that maybe is something that I, I just, I was, you know, I was invincible. I was like, I'll get through it. And, and, uh, and that was it. I was just uh, totally like, just show me what I got to do and I'll get through it. And, and lo and behold, you know, sort of did what they told me to do. And, Right, lifestyle uh, change and stuff. A little bit. <laughs> That's pretty good. They're for, doing really well. You know. Damn it. When Guns N' Roses was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, uh, you were part of the induction, but uh, you decided not to attend the ceremony. That's fact. That's fact. Mm -hmm. uh, why not uh, attend the ceremony? Um, there were some, some just some weird things, weird issues. Uh, one of the things was um, I was. They told me I could add one guest I could bring. You can only bring one guest. Yes, yeah, why well, I could pur and then purchase tickets for other guests, and it, which is yeah, right, very yeah. expensive tickets, and I couldn't afford it. Extremely, at the time. yeah. So we've heard a lot. Of... Should I bring my mom and not my dad, my brother and not my wife, Dude, that's my awful. daughter and not my son? I was I, c I couldn't deal with that. That was one one thing, and then another thing was uh, there wasn't. The the current members of Guns N' Roses weren't weren't um sure they weren't included weren't, in weren't that. invited and they weren't even invited of, to well, be there they weren't they weren't to be included and that just kind of weirded yeah. me out.